Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Bryla, and I am joined tonight by Lexi Neubauer. Say hi, Lexi. Hi, everyone. And we are from Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. Thank you for joining us for this free webinar, Beautiful and Easy Native Plants for Shade. Uh, we're doing this webinar um, because a lot of probably pretty much everybody who's watching realizes that we need to get more native plants in the ground to help our local ecosystem, to help our declining birds, to help our pollinators who are so dependent on those native plants to breed and feed. And, uh, you know, we all know their numbers are declining at a pretty scary pace. And, but for a lot of people who live in a very shady uh, whose yard has a lot of shade from those gorgeous trees overhead, it seems like a like an impossible uh, project to have a nice pollinator garden underneath all those trees and in all that shade. And this presentation is to show you how many beautiful and easy native plants there are specifically for that shady area. But before we start with that, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea for those of you who, are, who aren't familiar with us, who we are at Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. Our motto is restoring our environment one plant at a time. And we're very deliberate with this motto because we realize that every single plant that we plant makes a difference, makes a difference to our birds, makes a difference to our ecosystem, makes a difference to our pollinators and just creates a healthier environment. So don't feel like you have to convert your entire yard to a prairie. Please remember that every single native plant that we add to our landscape makes a difference. Sag Moraine is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization. All of our operating funds come from our memberships, our donations and our annual native plant sale, which is coming up on June 1st, uh, 2024. Uh, we do this through education and community outreach, and we strive to change the way people view the plants that surround them. We are located in the suburbs of Chicago, and uh, but like to talk about native plants to pretty much anybody who will listen. So welcome everybody watching this. We envision a future where native plants are embraced for their beauty and environmental impact, inspiring a grassroots movement towards responsible stewardship of urban landscapes. Anybody who owns land or anybody who has influence on land has such great power in improving the ecosystems with which we live. And we wanna help make that easy for people and, um, you know, check out our website as well. And we'll be talking more about that later because we have so many resources on the website to help make that as easy for you as possible. But I'll talk about that at the end. Oh, no, I'll talk about that now. So you can visit our website, sagmoraine.org. Again, we have tons of information and resources on there, uh, including our native plant selector, which that I will talk about at the very end of this presentation. And also please visit us on social media. We have, we are always posting a bunch of information on there, useful information to you, things that are going on with the organization. And if you are watching this on YouTube, would you please, oh, please hit that red button and subscribe. The more people that subscribe, the more people will see this very important information that could change the state of the very environment with it, in which we live. So again, please subscribe. Okay, back to beautiful and easy plants and easy native plants for shade. Yes, it is possible to have a thriving pollinator garden in the shade and how beautiful it is to have that cascade of color underneath those beautiful oak or birch or maple, whatever kind of trees you have in your yard, how gorgeous it is to have the drifts of color underneath. Now, I want to mention that all of the plants that we're going to list, Sag Moraine, we, we are really, um, our goal is to really help homeowners, business owners in urban and suburban areas that have smaller landscapes. We're not an organization that does, 
that does large scale restorations. We're really trying to help the, the landowners with smaller landscapes add native plants to their landscapes in a, in a beautiful way. And all of the plants that you'll be seeing in this presentation will look beautiful in a residential smaller landscape. They are all well behaved and they're the appropriate size for smaller urban landscapes. None of them are 10 foot tall or spread themselves all over or flop all over your sidewalk. These are plants that are that we have vetted that are, you know, very suitable to your landscape and just as important, they're hardy, dependable, and very versatile plants. So these are plants that you're not going to have to stand on your head and do three cartwheels to get them to grow. These are plants that are the some of the tried and true easiest plants to work with. Take it away, Lexi. All right. So the first native plant that we're going to look at that does very well in shade is called wild columbine. It is also known as red or American columbine. And I'll try to attempt to say the scientific name, Aquilegia canadensis. Um, Good you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's a beautiful plant and it's one of the only plants, uh, a native plants, um, few native plants that are red in um in our region. So it's red and it's yellow. Um, it grows to one to three feet tall and it has the most beautiful foliage. It kind of looks like a fern. Um, you'll see this in, in our native uh, woodlands, but it can grow in the full sun to the full shade. Um, it's a very important plant for our early pollinators because it blooms in May and June. And it's also very attractive to hummingbirds. Uh, we'll be looking at a lot of plants tonight that have this kind of shape where anything that has um, proboscis or, um, uh, you know, a long tongued insect will like these shapes of these flowers. It is the larval host plant for the columbine dusky uh, dusky wing. And we'll, as we look through these different plants, uh, they've all co-evolved with uh, insects. So there are some that are absolutely important to um, the survival of those particular species. Um, as we said, it's very adaptable. It grows from full sun to full shade, and it can also tolerate a wide range of soils as long as the drainage is good. Um, so it likes medium soil and um, it can also grow under pine trees, which some plants, you know, have trouble with that, but it's fine with uh, pine trees and it is also deer resistant, which is also important to a lot of people in the mid Midwest. All right, back to you, Kathy, with the wild blue phlox. Wild blue phlox. This is so gorgeous when it is blooming. Um this drifts of ground hugging purple lavender that that cover the ground just just gorgeous um one of the favorite you know uh i had learned early early flowering nectar sources for the hummingbird clearwing moth did you ever see a hummingbird clearwing moth lexi no i haven't hummingbird clearwing moths i had read that are supposed to love this this plant in the spring um, but it is also attractive to butterflies and hummingbirds. Again, it's got that little hole in the center of that flower, not a big bee plant. So, I mean, we love our bees and we hope you embrace bees too, but this is a plant that is really going to be more for the um, the types of uh, pollinating insects that have the long proboscis that goes in that center circle. This will grow in part shade to shade. It likes medium to moist soil. And again, it's a wonderful low ground cover. It gets to 12 inches tall at best. Blooms April through June. Um, it is a great edge plant for shady areas. It will look beautiful under your trees. But I will say that if you have a lot of rabbits in your area, this is one of their favorites. So in that case, you may want to avoid this plant but if you have normal rabbit activity and you know nothing nothing outlandish over there then you're then you're good to add some of this beautiful plant um another favorite is wild geranium so geranium maculatum <laughs> This plant, and like a lot of the native plants, it can do well in part sun to shade to even full sun, I think, for wild geranium. 
And that's what makes these plants so easy and uh, really ensures your success with these plants because they really can adapt to a lot of different conditions. They want to thrive. Uh, so this one does very well in medium to dry soil. I also have it in clay soil and it's doing great. Uh, it's liked by our early pollinators. Again, this is blooming early in May and June. It's very easy to grow and it can, it'll spread uh, by self-seeding. Uh, you'll see it when you're, you know, plant it your first year by your second year, it's already spreading and filling out the areas that you need to cover. And uh, an interesting fact about this plant is that its seeds have a little tail that helps them propel into the ground and that's how it, it uh, accomplishes its self-seeding. Um, so this again, you'll see this in the woodlands, especially in, Around here in the Chicago suburbs, you'll definitely see this plant, um, but just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant and definitely one to add to your native garden. You know, and Lexi made such a great point with how easy these plants can be if they're in the right location. And for example, the plants that we're showing you tonight, you know, some of them are fine in, um, you know, sun to shade, but then some of them, like this one we're going to be talking about next, but some of them truly want shade or and or part shade. But as long as they're in the right location for sunlight and moisture, these plants are become they're very um they're they're very easy because they remember they co-evolved with our soil. And so you don't need to um fertilize for these plants. They like our soil just like it is. So don't worry about you know ever having to fertilize them. Um, as I said, planted in the right conditions, these, these plants are, and especially after the first two years when they can set down a good root system and become much more drought tolerant, very they become very easy to maintain plants. Certainly way more, um, way easier to maintain than grass or sod. But here's hairy beard tongue and uh, penstemon, Here's Sutus. Um, the penstemons are just great plants. And, and this one is called hairy beard tongue because you can see in the inside of the little flowers there, you see the little hairs there. Um, it's so much fun to see bumblebees and other small insects go in and out of these flowers on, on penstemon. They just, they just love these plants. They will thrive in full sun to full shade. And if that's not adaptable, I don't know what it is. Um, they'll do well in dry to medium soil. They bloom May and June. And the cool thing about this penstemon as opposed to another penstemon, which is also, you know, equally great, but doesn't, doesn't do as well in full shade. But this penstemon stays pretty low. I mean, think of that, only 18 inches tall. Uh, it will attract bumblebees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. And as I said, it's a, tra a more attractive, shorter penstemon than the more common penstemon um, digitalis. Beautiful plant. On we go to our goldenrods. Uh, now this is a later summer bloomer. Um, this one's called zigzag goldenrod because of how the leaves um, zigzag kind of back and forth with the flowers. And its scientific name is Solidago flexi. Collis, um, the flexicollis being the zigzag. Uh, it is a keystone plant for Illinois, which means it's super important and uh, super important to our pollinators and also to our traveling monarch butterflies. Um, it is also a larval host plant. And it, the very important thing to note is that goldenrods do not cause hay fever. Um, there are other plants that cause hay fever, but it is not goldenrod. Um, so don't worry about planting this plant. It's not gonna make anyone sneeze. Um, this this particular golden rod likes part shade to shade. So this is one that you really need to make sure is in dappled shade or shade um, to make sure that it does well. And it likes medium to dry soil, one to three feet tall. So it's not gonna get huge. There are some golden rods that can get up to six feet tall, but this is gonna be a, a shorter one. And uh, it blooms through August through October. So it's also gonna be blooming when our beautiful asters start to bloom. And uh, the color, you know, the purple of those asters uh, next to this yellow of the goldenrod is just a fantastic combination. 
Um, so this is a great color camp uh, companion for asters in the fall, and it can move around. You know, all of these plants do uh, self seed. That's what they're born to do is to propagate, but not into not in a way that it's going to take over your landscape. On to the asters. Wonderful. And, and on that topic, remember any of these plants that do have a tendency to seed themselves, you can, after they flower, you can trim off some of the seed heads to uh, make them less likely to seed themselves around. But please leave some of them because remember those very seed heads are nature's bird food to sustain our birds throughout the winter. So, um, but you certainly can remove some of, of them if you're you know, very concerned about, about plants seeding themselves. But um, when, when my plants seed themselves, I'm always like, yay, I have another one, but um, that's me. So I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this one. Would you like to try Lexi? Uh, Simphi, try, oh, I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> we can just, just call it shorty. <laughs> this is shorty. So yes, I mean, asters along with goldenrods are, are two of the most important, uh, types of plants in our, in our Illinois ecosystem. And so, so important for those migrating monarch butterflies that are, that we're trying to keep from going extinct. Um, so, so important. And yes, here's a wonderful variety that will, um, that will thrive in the shade. Most of them like the sun, but this one will thrive in part to full shade. It also stays on the shorter side. It only gets to be about three feet tall. It likes medium to medium dry soil. So again, it's not something that you have to water intensely. Um, all the time blooms August, September, October, just so important for those, like, as I said, those migrating uh, monarchs or the other pollinators that are getting ready to hibernate for the winter. It is a keystone plant, which Lexi mentioned, asters and goldenrods, extremely important keystone plants in our area. Uh, and that's because they are such important native plants for our native pollinators and our native birds. Beautiful. So now we've looked at some really gorgeous flowering plants and we want to fill in some of our garden with some really important plants which are called sedges. And sedges are grass-like plants, um, but they also bloom. And uh, so the genus is Carex and this one is Carex springelli. Sounds kind of like spaghetti, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the long beach, beak sedge, and that has to do with how um, these pods look uh, where the seed head is. Uh, this grows to two feet tall. This one really does like shade, and it likes medium wet to medium dry dry soil. So you want to make sure this is in either you know dappled sunlight or full shade to make sure that it's successful. Uh, it'll bloom from May, June through July. Uh, its active growing season is actually in the early spring and the, in the fall when the soil is cool. And uh, a lot of these sedges, as we look at these different uh, plants, we have a couple more sedges to look at, but they make these beautiful clumps and they just kind of fill in between all of your beautiful uh, flowering native plants. And they just make a really good accent and really add a level of sophistication to your garden. Um, it has this ornamental seed head, which again is very important for our birds. Um, so we talk a lot about pollinators, but the birds are just as important and uh, everything's always interconnected. So those seeds will drop in the fall and will be a great source of food uh, for the birds later on. And it's uh, great for landscaping. It looks really beautiful and can fill in areas. And all of uh, the plants in the Carex family are deer resistant, which a lot of people are looking for. <laughs> so great one if you've got a lot of uh, grazing deer visiting your backyard. Okay, one of my favorites. Um, these guys are blooming right now as we speak, and I'm so happy that I have um, a lot of colonization of these. They're they're just gorgeous. So these are Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica, and um, these are what are called an ephemeral. So spring ephemerals 
are plants that come up with the sunlight from the because the trees don't yet have leaves. So they come up early, early and do their flowering. So important, life sustainingly important to our early season, early emerging pollinators. And then once by the time the, the trees are leafing out, these um, die back and any other forbs or um, sedges that you have planted under the trees can then come up and thrive. So by the time those start coming up, these are done, but these are going to give you a beautiful, um, just a beautiful mass of color in April and May. They do like, as I said, shade to part shade, uh, medium moist soil, and they get to be one to two feet tall. Uh, they are, as I said, they're a wonderful spring flower and they can form colonies and they will spread. I'm not going to say they're not going to spread. I do have them coming up in many areas, but it's wonderful to see them spread because remember, they're not going to get in the way of any of your other plants that are coming up. They are going to be done blooming and they die back completely to the ground before your other plants really get going. So it's wonderful to have them spread around so you have that beautiful spring color and uh, very shade and woodland friendly. So I highly recommend putting some Virginia bluebells in your landscape. Love that flower. And it's so exciting when they pop up in the spring. Do you, do you have some blooming? No, nope, but I'm getting some this year at the Gotta plant sale. Some. I don't have okay. any yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of Jacob's Ladder, but I need, I need bluebells now. Uh, so the next uh, sedge that we're going to look at is called the common wood sedge. And, you know, these names are kind of funny because they're, they sound like they're not exciting, but they're some of the most gorgeous plants. Uh, Carex blanda. There's nothing bland about this Carex. Uh, so this one has a great clumping habit as well. That's really beautiful in the landscape. And it'll have these little shoots that you can see here um, that just pop up uh, in the spring. So this one is only 12 inches tall. They look really good planted in clusters together. So you could do a cluster of three, you could do a cluster of five, um, but they really add a dramatic effect when you're putting them all together and would look really good in a border like that. Um, these ones will do well, full sun to full shade, but again, the Carex family really seems to prefer um, some part shade to full shade and wet to medium dry soil. Um, this one is also deer and rabbit resistant. So again, um, for anyone who has those grazers, uh, th this is a great one to plant and will add some texture and interest uh, to your shade garden. Another sedge look at that curly little mop head looking grassy looking delicate and wispy such a such a pretty um soft texture on this sedge it's called curly styled wood sedge or carex rosa and um i guess when the when it starts blooming when it gets the 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 little flowers that turn into seed heads i guess they have a little they have a little bit of a pinkish color to them so that's where it gets the name rosa uh only gets to 12 inches tall again part to full shade medium wet to dry soil i mean it's amazing how adaptable these plants are when you say medium wet to dry soil you know as a rule the soil is pretty dry underneath trees because trees take in so much of the moisture so a lot of these said you know plants that will do well in dry soil they're just perfectly suited to be around the base of trees this will bloom in june and again a versatile sedge that's great in any size landscape and as i said earlier works, works well in difficult dry shady areas which is a lot of a lot of tree areas right under the tree so um put some of these in so you have that that beautiful soft peaceful carpet of green underneath your trees great ground cover and as Lexi said like most uh sedges this is also deer resistant can just imagine a whole bunch of those as ground cover you don't even need mulch you can just do green mulch with uh, sedges, sedges, sedges. Um, okay. So really great way to uh, increase habitat and to make something beautiful too. Uh, this one is also good for a ground cover. This is large leaf aster, 
Eurybia macrophylla. I think I did that pretty well. Uh, the reason it's, it's, uh, it's actually got heart shaped leaves, um, which are really beautiful. And they're actually quite, quite large, these leaves. And that's what makes it a good, uh, ground cover. It grows about 12 inches tall, but the flowers shoot up and those will be a little bit taller, maybe up to 18 inches tall, um, with these little dainty white flowers. And it's called a non showy bloom because because they are so dainty and small, but the pollinators love these. Um, I have several of these in my garden and the the bees, the bumblebees are just all over them. They can't get enough of it. Um, it is really important, uh, again, a late season bloomer, August through October. And this one really does like part shade to shade, but mine has definitely leaned into the sunshine and isn't afraid of it, but definitely will do well in the shade. Uh, dry to moist soils. So again, you can't get any better than that. <laughs> it will tolerate most conditions. And um, it is definitely shorter than some of our other, other asters. Uh, you know, some like New England aster can get up to five to six feet tall, but this one uh, is definitely a little bit lower and is a good uh, border plant for your shade garden. I'm just looking at the list of the plants that we've we've gone over tonight. And, you know, I'm seeing that we have the Columbine red, the blue phlox, kind of the lavender wild geranium, uh, the lavender and yellow beard tongue, the, the yellow zigzag goldenrod, the shorts aster. Then we had that, that large leaf aster, which is white. So much color. Think of how much color you can create in a shady area. And we don't think of having vibrant, colorful gardens in shaded areas. Um, but it, it, it certainly is possible. So with that, I mean, that will conclude our list. I do just want to mention to everybody who lives in the, the Chicago area um, that we are having our third annual native plant sale on Saturday, June 1st, 2024, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Moraine Valley Community College. Anybody who watched this um, uh, presentation and would like to place an order at our website, uh, Enter the code SHADE10 at checkout to order a, um, if you, at, at checkout, if you're going to order a pre, we have thousands of plants available for individual purchase the day of, but we have a pre-order uh, component to our plant sale. And if you order those online until what date, Lexi? Uh, uh, until Mother's Day. So May 12th, um, our plant packages will be available. And, and so put in shade 10 at checkout. And we just wanted to show you one of the um, packages that we're offering this year is our Shady Sanctuary full shade package. And you can see that it comes in 10 inch plants. I mean, I mean, 10 plants, 20 plants or 50 plants. And the plants that we went through tonight are all represented in our 50 plant package. Uh, but these packages will not only, I mean, you not only will have the plants, but you will also have the design and know how to arrange them as you plant them. Uh, shorter plants in the front, taller plants in the back, all bloom, you know, all blooming seasons are represented. So you'll have lots of shady color throughout spring, summer, and fall. And here's the, the photo and, and the different plants that are in that full shade 50 plant package. So again, if you live in the area and you're looking for another way to make creating a shade garden easier, uh, check out this plant package. But otherwise, please check out wherever you live some of these plants that we discussed tonight. Just wonderful plants to, to bring habitat and life and beauty and color to your shade garden. And thank you again for joining us. And visit, or to help you do that, please visit our native plant selector at sagmoraine.org because the plants that we discussed tonight are in no way um, the only appropriate plants for shade or check out some of the other site conditions. We have a great native plant selector on the website. And again, all these plants have been vetted to be plant native plants that are appropriate for smaller urban and suburban landscapes. So again, please check that out at sagmoraine.org. Thank you for joining us tonight. 
and happy gardening.